Hey everyone, quick little announcement here from Fish in the DMV. Our weekend warrior package on Patreon is nearly full. There are only 48 spots still available. Once these spots are gone, they're gone, and the weekend warrior tier will be closed to the general public. All members will be locked in indefinitely at a fantastic price point, and they will get all the benefits that they have today, plus any new benefits and discounts that will be added in the future. All Weekend Warriors will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rod. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, loads of members-only content. And in 2025, there are going to be tournaments that will be given a massive discount specifically to our Weekend Warrior members. Plus, if you sign up for the year right now, you will get 8% off your already fantastically discounted rate to join the Weekend Warrior program. Link in the episode description. Thank you. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aaron. Today, I am joined by uh, Jake Monty and then Logan Anderson. Uh, they finished first and second place at the uh, Bugs Island BFL Super Tournament that happened last week post flood, which uh, honestly, at first, I was a little surprised that we we're going to have the damn tournament. I mean, you know, God forbid the BFLs make a smart decision and be like, you know, half of Appalachia is dying. We should still hold this tournament. Screw it. Um, what were you guys' thoughts getting into this stupid thing? Like, did you think it was going to happen when, like, the New River Valley was gone? So, be before that, Jake, tell them about the tournament you fished right before you came to the tournament. Yeah, so the weekend before this tournament, I had the two-day super tournament BFL on Norman. And I don't know if you've ever been to Norman or not, but there's no there's no logs it doesn't matter how hard it rains on norman it doesn't hardly get muddy and there's never a log mat now the yadkin uh, you can walk across that place but lake norman doesn't see log mats and after i guess um what was it james was like nine feet high hickory was flooded the first day of the bfl here all the way down to the dam was a log mat on the main river and we fished both days i've never seen it before all the way down to the bottom end of the lake, running down in the dark, in the fog, dodging the logs. That tournament actually should have been canceled. <laughs> but we fished both days. And lucky not they just anything. assume every angler has banging insurance, like the way they just <laughs> send you out there. I mean, it's one if everyone's got a brand new boat and they can rip their transom and they get a brand new one. But like for most of us, like shit, that's not, that's not happening if you eat one of those logs. No. no. I th luckily, though, Curb was actually it was coming up the week before because they got they had storms before the hurricane so mm -hmm. it was kind of it was kind of a slower rise into curry it wasn't as much as like a flash flood or so it, there were logs on the upper end but it wasn't it wasn't too bad down the lake so you could i, I was surprised because bugs is usually the toilet bowl of the area when it comes to everything coming in there and so i was shocked at really how well it took it all honestly yeah. We we were we had heard before we went down there some people saying like you're gonna see the you know the three ten three twelve Kerr Lake which I've never even put my boat in at that you know in the parking lot I, I know it gets to there but I've never done it and everybody says it's just terrible so we were kind of hoping that was not the case three oh five is really not that bad realistically so I mean what the is, fishing was terrible don't get me wrong but well, yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Kerr fishing is. Uh, I have a love hate with that lake. I like to really promote just the lakes that are just fishing well. And I feel like with Kerr, it's it's a F plus student. And whenever it gets a D, we're supposed to clap and celebrate. And it's like, no, like just because it is a bunch of hotels doesn't mean we should celebrate it when Gaston and Smith are fishing way better in recent years compared to that place. I'd, I'd um, rather sleep on the riverbank than stay at a hotel at freaking Kerr Lake. So <laughs> like, yeah, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, the worst of your wars would be getting robbed. There's worse things in some of those hotel sheets. Um, <laughs> yeah, those places are nasty. I remember I stayed there with my brother in a high school tournament. There was like blood on the carpet, <laughs> but we got a great yeah, deal. It was I like 30 it. bucks. <laughs> um, when you have you guys ever fished a tournament at this level before? Or was this all brand new with the conditions? Um. I mean, we fished, we both fished college. So, I mean, those are like 260 boat tournaments. Now, as far as the regional, you, we've both Jake, been. Huh? Do you mean water level? Yes. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were talking about like the level of the tournament. Um, <laughs> I, fi- well, I figure you fish one or two good tournaments. <laughs> yeah. No. Now, as far as the water level, I fished curb. I think highest was like three hundred two before this. I haven't been there that much. Fished like four tournaments, and okay. then there were places here where it was like eighty yards behind the bushes, which was kind of dumb. <laughs> and mm-hmm. Made it made it awful. <laughs> And and I fished it in the open last year, got my ass kicked, but uh, I did fish in the open last year and it was the same level. It was like 305 or 304 and a half and it was just miles back in there. So, I mean, let, let, let's hopscotch over that thing. What do you think about the opens coming to Bugs Island? I watched that and part of me thought it was a bleep show, but what was your impression being there? I mean... The problem with bugs in general, and, and you know, we'll talk about this when we go through the tournament, but it, you, you can be doing the exact right thing. And for example, me and Pal Kemp were like spot hopping and I finished like 120th or 80th or something like that. And he finished first and had 18 and 16 back to back days. And I was watching him drive around the whole day. Like we were just like, mm-hmm. he would pull in, I was there. I would pull in, he was there. He was just better than me. But to an extent, Kerr is like, you can be doing the exact right thing at the exact right time and there will be a guy that pulls up and catches fours in his stretch and you will catch twos doing the exact same thing and th- there's just a group of bigger fish that when you hit them it's it's magic but when you don't you just are frustrated even though you're catching a pile of fish so uh, and so for an open th- kind of what i was getting at with that for an open it's very frustrating because having that local advantage and kind of knowing how it goes you're also like, oh crap! Like I'm about to get beat by somebody that like has no clue and just lands on them, you know. Mm-hmm. Whereas I feel like a lot of lakes don't set up that way. But so for is an there, open, it kind of sucks. Is there any lake that this is kind of like um, Murray, Hartwell, any of those blueback lakes? Is it set up any like those? It's getting like those, but yeah, um, yeah. at the same time, I mean those like Murray and Hartwell and like that. Most of your biggest bags in the tournament will come out deep but curves still still more towards the bank like your biggest bags in the tournament still going to be shallow that's fascinating I, I did fish clark's hill for the first time this year and i called jake during practice and said this is this is Kerr lake with a little more hair and more spotted bass like it's I, it looks I the heard, exact same i heard that place is on the uptick too that people have been sleeping on that place for a while I, I mean, I was there in June, and I think I had like 11 and a half and finished like 30th or something, which really is not how it's been for the last couple of years. So it's definitely rebounding. It was it's fun. It's like, changing yeah. <laughs> pretty rapidly. So Kerr might, might start to kind of switch and become more like Murray and Hartwell. Lewis. But it doesn't have the timber, though, so it probably won't ever no. be. Murray doesn't have timber either. Murray doesn't have it either, but... No, it's got enough cane pole piles though to fill a Christmas tree <laughs> store. I mean, it's insane. Uh, if if you guys that are listening haven't graphed that place, it's like holy shit. <laughs> There's I don't know where they find all the bamboo. Honestly, that's the more impressive Gee, part. Guys down at Kerr are starting to make it like that. Every point I, down the lake, you just got like two or three of them on it. It's, yeah, it's it's uh, it's fascinating how that place evolves, and hopefully, I don't know, maybe the bigger spots will get in there. Um, I was talking to some biologists that the spot are younger in there compared to like Gaston and Philpot. Mm-hmm. So they were a newer addition. So time and will they, tell. And they played in this tournament too, like big time. I, mean, oh, I weighed I, in, I think five out of my 15 were spots or maybe six or seven. And Jake, you weighed in quite a few. Yeah. On the, well, on the last day, I think four of them were spotted by us. Yeah. Mm. Do, would F1s even help that lake, too. you think? <laughs> Really? I don't know. The whole F1 thing, I don't, I don't know. What, what do you with mean? Kerr's, it's... it's th- right, go ahead, Jay. Sorry. Uh, I don't know. It's just hard to say because Kerr... The thing with Kerr is there are so many fish in that lake. Like, someday... Now, I waited four on the second day, so you wouldn't be able to tell. But there are, there's more bass in that lake than I think any of the lakes around here. Like, you hit it on the right day when they're biting. I mean, they're just freaking everywhere. So, I don't know if... If introducing F ones or anything like that would really help, or if it just needs time, because I mean, that place is still, still kind of recovering from yeah. what it went through. What was it? Was it ten years ago? Bass virus, all that and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about um, ten years so, ago. 
don't know. And, and, and the blue that, back are new too. Yeah. So. But before that, that place had 25, 25 pound bags. I mean, at one point. So, I mm-hmm. mean, the genetics, they're in there. I just don't know if they'll ever get back to that. But. Since we'll, we'll be definitely beating around Kerr a lot in this conversation, but you, you mentioned, Jake, that you guys both fish college. Who did you guys represent? UNC Charlotte. NC State. Oh, oh dang. Did you guys fish the, were you the FLW days or the, when uh, BBT took it over and Boyd? Um, I split. I was FLW for two years, maybe. I graduated in 2022, 20, I think. So. Yeah, I'm still there. I haven't fished MLF. And I didn't fish any MLF last year. Their schedule was ridiculous. <laughs> but, um, so I'll probably just be doing bass. What was the hardest thing, like for me in Northern Virginia, fishing college was going from River Rat to going to Murray and like, Jesus, this is different. Being a Carolina boy, when you got to travel for college, whether you like, was there a, a fishery that you got to experience? It's like, I really got to learn this quickly. Tennessee River. Really? Mm-hmm. Place is awful. Is, <laughs> that is the, the Tennessee River is the hardest bass fishery for a Carolina man to go to. I mean, you just look at the weight, except for Brian Thrift, he can catch him there. But other than that, if a North Carolinian goes to Tennessee River, he's at the bottom. Unless there's Shad Spawn go. There's Shad Spawn. <laughs> if there's Scott a Hammer, he's going to catch a bass. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and for the exact same reason, Florida. And it's because those guys fish, it's, it's spot oriented, it's not a pattern. It is you have your spot and you're betting that that's the right spot to be on. And it mm-hmm. it might be, it might not be. But instead of running 200 different perfect docks in a day or whatever, you're just like, yep, this is my shell bar and they're going to be here. And at some point they're going to bite. <laughs> and that just, oh, gross. I had, okay, I would have had Florida on my bingo card for that. But the TVA feels like you can still kind of do the Carolina running gun thing. You would think so, but all the Carolina guys suck theirs, <laughs> myself included. So hmm. they're also they're also they're different. I mean, it depends on uh, I don't know. I was gonna say it depends on the time of year, but they're always now they're all one off the bank regardless. Hmm. But is it the current? Was, yeah, current and all oh, those places. Shoot, those places have changed too. Kentucky you used to. You used to go down there in the spring and compete shallow or even win out of the bushes, and now you got to catch smallmouth on the main river. That's so. a huge change. I remember when that thing was pulling out mega largemouth bags, and now it's becoming yeah. like a smallmouth destination. Like, how did it's, that it's, happen? I don't know. It's kind of cool, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Well, and those guys are like next level with it, too. Like, I remember. I think it was the college guys this year. They were talking about side scanning and and marking beds on stumps from side scan, which is absurd to me. Like, I'm good with side scan, but that's crazy. Mm -hmm. That is insane. I mean, that that, that place, it's just so crazy. I mean, the carp hit that place so freaking hard um, when that came in. I wonder how much that devastated the largemouth. And then, uh, like, I think... um, the lake above oh my god i always i'm always bad with uh chickamauga caillou not, no chickamauga yeah chickamauga uh, i want to say chautauqua because i went up there so much for college and that's the wrong damn state but <laughs> it feel like the grass there when it died off or when the tva just started to lower the water man that place got hurt real bad it has not been the same so so for example on that my co-angler in this tournament is he won his third regional i had him on day two and day three <laughs> So he's won three boats, but two of them were both back-to-back years on Kentucky Lake. And he was telling me about, like, dude, I was ripping a trap out of the grass. I was throwing a chatterbait, like, eight-pounder, six-pounder, you know, 20-pound bag from the back of the boat. And then, you know, when I went up there, it was, like, the next year after they nuked the grass or, you know, whatever, nuked the grass. And I think we caught, like, seven bass and like, five days of fishing. (laughs) So it was just terrible. Y'all are just lucky. I was there. For a high school <laughs> national championship in August of twenty nineteen, if was it? No, no. I think it's like nineteen. Yeah, it would be like eighteen. It was. I'm not that. I'm not that young. It was like eight. <laughs> it was like it, it, was 20, <laughs> it was like it was between twenty seventeen and nineteen. And if you idled across a flat, a carp was coming in the boat. I mean, they're just they're mm. everywhere. You'd go out to the river, flick a graph on, couldn't even see the bottom. 
because they had it so stacked through the water column. You couldn't even make a cast without hitting the carp. The only thing I caught on a big crankbait was foul hooking carp. I didn't catch any bass on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you're going to be getting that stuff out of there. When you went, I know you already had, you said you had the uh, Norman event. So was that going to limit your practice for this one at all? Or like, how were you planning on practicing leading up to this one? Um, I mean, the Norman event didn't specifically limit my practice, but it did mean that I had to do a little bit of school the following week. So that limited my practice. So I ended up getting a day and a half, but, um, cause I took Friday off before the Norman tournament. So I had to do a little bit beginning of the week before Kerr, but, uh, yeah, so I ended up, I got a day and a half, which was about what I expected. Logan? Yeah, I, I skipped the, uh, for a couple of reasons, I skipped the, the Norman one, which hindsight ended up being a great decision after what happened to the lake. But uh, me, you know, me and my fiance, we went and you know, rambled or whatever, and then I ended up leaving on Sunday. I got down there, what, like three, four o'clock Sunday afternoon and fish that um fish that afternoon practice monday had to go to a funeral on tuesday and then practice wednesday and wednesday i probably didn't spend a half day because i kind of already knew what i was going to be doing um and i'd already confirmed that so i just i kind of hang her up and, and just got ready for the next day so can you over practice for an event like this when you have a blown out tide or a blown out tide the blown out conditions Yes, because you can stick all your fish. <laughs> I mean, you can. Especially in the fall. Because even with mm-hmm. it up that high, if you go through an area and you catch a lot of them, I mean, you you burn you burn them up, you know. Now, they move they move around a lot on that place, but I know in the fall, if I've ever gone through an area and go try to go back through, it never, it never works out. I mean, so, I mean, basically, it sounds like we can get just straight into it. Um, going into that morning the first day what were your preconceived notions i think i think we both have pretty similar pretty similar thoughts based off of practice we could we could see either one of us catching 15 or 16 pounds but we could also see you know nine ten pounds but that's curly in general for me Mm -hmm. uh, definitely but two pounds <laughs> yeah two pounds i mean you, you don't need to know what can happen for five yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh but i mean when i saw this i was like jesus swept 21 pounds like my god you could literally just sleep in the next day like well you would have thought that i did if you looked at the <laughs> second day <laughs> He literally would have thought that guy blew out two tires on the way to the river. His boat wouldn't start. He must have only fished from one till way in to come up with. And we wouldn't have blamed you with that kind of day. I mean, again, that's a magical day for this lake. Like, how was there a moment? Was it just magical all day, or was it just one bite? Like, um, it was. It was a stretch that I'd found in practice, and in practice, I'd got. Uh, a three, one a little over three, and I had another one that just bit my jig as I was reeling it back to the boat. I didn't catch him, but he left a boil in the water where he bit my jig that, I mean, big boil. I knew it was a big fish, and then I just left. So I didn't know. I didn't know exactly what was there. I just knew I had two bites better than anything else I've been fishing in practice. And the remaining day of practice, I didn't find anything else. So... I returned to that stretch on the first day of the tournament about nine o'clock and caught everything I weighed in within an hour, within about 150 yards. And, uh, that was it. Was there a moment that you thought there was a thing happening? Yes. And that's actually what got me in trouble because (laughs) in practice, in practice, the two bites I had, I had one bite on the stretch where it went down, but I had another bite kind of around the corner and, I mean, it wasn't far. It was like a mile or two away. And they were on very specific things. They were all sitting on the same thing, the same spot. And I thought that I'd found the pattern, you know, to do well. And so I figured when I got out of there on the first day of the tournament, I was going to come back and be able to replicate that in other areas real close to there, just running a pattern or whatever. But that wasn't the case. They were just ended up being some 
a couple groups of fish, wolf packing, running up and down the bank that were using these areas, and I just happened to hit. I just happened to land on them. Really, were they all green ones, or did you like have a six pound spotted bass mixed in there? No, no, the, they were all largemouth. It was uh, the first day. I didn't. I didn't see a spotted bass till the second day, and then I started looking for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and Logan, let's pivot to your day because you have more of like a. I would looking at the stats here, like a mot. Like this is how you would, in theory, win at Kerr. You know, thirteen, eleven, thirteen. Very consistent, above average swing in here. It kind of almost reminds me like Lake Champlain, where ounces count, and it's just you're just. I'm assuming not having heard your story, just a shit ton of calling and making those little adjustments. But how did your day one go? So, so to go back to practice, um, you know, with the water being that high, everybody goes to the bushes, right? That's just, that's just what you do. And most of your brush and offshore structure that at least the man-made stuff, they put in like 15 to 20. Well, with the water coming up, that stuff's now in, 20 to 25 to even 30 some of them so a lot of those your your bass kind of move off of them so it's kind of like that further encourages people to hit the bank well all through practice i would just i'd go deep and then i'd go shallow and you go shallow and you sometimes you pull up and like first flip you catch like a two and a half pounder and then you might go an hour and a half without getting another bite and jake kind of experienced the same thing so what we talked about was kind of like you either got, you just got to do it all day and it might just not happen. And you got to be okay with that if you're going to do that. And I wasn't okay with that. So I have enough, um, I've spent enough time up there between, I guess what, five or six BFLs now. And then I fished there a decent amount in college that I've got some offshore stump rows and some rock piles. And I kind of got on a, a deal with a jig where you could, you're, you're picking them off a of scope for sure. But sometimes you just throw at the target and they would be so tight to it that they would appear. And um, I think a lot of people were overlooking those because there's so much bait and spotted bass in the water, the little bee spots, that guys would throw at them, they'd follow it, and they're like, oh, they won't bite. But in reality, they're throwing at like six-inch spotted bass. They ain't going to be able to bite anything. So <laughs> unless maybe like a little drop shot, which some guys were doing. But... So what I did is I figured out that jig deal and I was like, okay, well I can go not beat the bushes at least until I get a decent limit and get to where I need to be. And then I can get in the bushes and hopefully make a big call from a you know four or five pound bank runner, which never happened. But uh, that was kind of my game plan because I just, I didn't feel like I could effectively compete with everybody else in the bushes because then it's just a crap shoot. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you find a good stretch like Jake did, which I did not. So I, I went all in on the offshore stuff, uh, which I say that I did, you know, if I saw an open spot shallow that I liked, I would run over there. But man, you know, those little willow pockets on the main lake, the stuff that everybody knows at Kerr Lake, it was just a rotating carousel of boats. You know, one guy would pull out and the next guy would pull in. And there was just, they just weren't there. And you can tell by the weights. So yeah. yeah. They were kind of there the first day, and then, I mean, after four days mm -hmm. of practice and first day of the tournament, that stuff was so beat up. Well, and you could tell, too, because through practice, like you talk to a guy on Monday. He's like, man, they're in the bushes good. And then Tuesday, like, man, I'm not getting quite as many bites as I was in the bushes. And then Wednesday, they're like, dude, this sucked. <laughs> and then Thursday, they're like, man. <laughs> So it's kind of you could just see it from and 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 we we're going out of nut bush, so everybody's in nut bush. I mean, you could get. I mean, Jake talked about tournament day. You would run to the mouth of nut bush, and by the time you got there, there's like four boats going to grassy and nobody else. Everybody stayed. In everybody nut bush. stayed. <laughs> yeah, and they were chasing the falling water. It sounded like, um, mm. which is it's a pro, it's just I, I've never understood that ever since high school days. We're like, oh, they're always in the bushes. It's like bullshit, Stanley. Like they've been in the bushes three times in the last fifty years, and it lasts for three days. But most of the time I'm there, those bushes never are stable with water in them. But that's what you'll hear from every dude at Walmart and Bass Pro Shop is flipping those bushes. But you hit on something that's really interesting when it talked about rotations. But we have scope. And the smallmouth up here on the upper Potomac and Susky, they'll do that. They get so down close to those rocks. Unless you throw your drop shot, you wouldn't know there's a three or four pound smallmouth. So did you just flip a coin on the rotation that you started with? Or how did you pick your rotation? 
Well, it, it was pretty easy because even with all those guys fishing up shallow, there was still, uh-huh. you know, so the divisions that came here were Shenandoah, Northeast, um, South Carolina, and what was the other one, Jake? Ohio. The Ohio uh, River. Ohio. Uh, which those dudes, they call them. But uh, so the South Carolina guys, you know, your Murrays, your Hartwells, when that water comes up, they do not care. Those dudes just stay out there scoping. So they were out there on the points pretty hard. Um, so it really came down to when a spot opened up that I liked and uh, okay. kind of, you know, I stayed within about a five mile area um, towards the mouth of Nut Bush. And you could kind of watch and see, like, you know, like at 9 a.m., there was around this one island, there's a bunch of shoals and rocks and stuff that everybody fishes. They school really good there. It's, it's a community hole. But at 9 30, 10 o'clock, there wouldn't be a soul there. And then maybe later in the day, they're back. So I, you know, I'd fish away from them Smart. for a while and then they'd open up and you just go run through, catch you two or three, and then leave when nobody else is hitting them. And you could really tell a difference on if you pulled up on a fresh spot because, you know, the ones that, had boats going over them and everything else. The guys weren't really catching them, but they had a lot of pressure. You know, a lot of boats, seeing a lot of lures and stuff. Um, they had a lot of pressure. So. You mentioned that a lot of guys would see the six inchers, like try to chase their bait, and they'd be dealing with that. When you scoped, did you see the same fish and just were fishing not even for them and dropping your jig through? Was that kind of mentally what you had to do? Yeah, so I would I would take that. That was part of the reason for the jig is I felt like with the drop shot, yeah, you know, you throw a drop shot and ten little bitty ones go at it. That that three pound spot or three pound large mouse is just going to stay there on a stump. He doesn't really care. But if you drop that big jig and they all kind of scatter, and they sees why they scatter, then he he might go over there and look at it. It was kind of my mentality, and it was just it was just fast. I mean, you could just hit them, hit them, hit them, hit them, hit them, and. You know, you, you'd have to throw a pile of them to get a bite, but not as many as the guys throwing drop shot had to. So, I mean, they were talking about throwing a two or 300, and I'd throw it like 15 or 20, and I'd catch one. And That's grand, cool. half of those probably weren't bass, because there's a whole lot of catfish in that lake, and there's a, they're the same less, size as the bass. That's way less flips than it took to get a bush bite, that's for sure. <laughs> It's it's funny you mentioned the catfish to save it from the story, but that's an issue on the the Potomac is you pan out to a, a a brush pile and you'll see like a hornet's nest sometimes and you cast in there and they're all blue cats and at this point maybe it's it's wrong but if I catch a blue cat in area I just freaking leave because I have rarely had great success when you smoke a catfish that there's a bunch of bass in there with them. I had I I really coming into this tournament thought I was gonna be running brush because I got a bunch of like really good sneaky brush piles. And then the water came up six feet, but uh, every one of them was full of fish, and I mean like slam full of them. I'm pretty sure they were all catfish. That's insane. I didn't realize there's that many catfish in that lake right now. Because mm-hmm. I I never caught anything out of those piles in the tournament, and by the middle of the second day, I never ran another one. Because every one of them was loaded and every one of them would not bite. I don't know if it was bass and they were just finicky or if it was catfish, but I think it was catfish. Just by the movement, the lack of interest, you, you can kind of tell. I mean, now you can tell a really big catfish, but there's a lot of them that size that, you know, they look just like a bass. I know guys mm-hmm. say they can tell them apart. I don't believe it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I don't have that ability, um, but I know that they will swarm sometimes like bass and you'll get mm-hmm. in there and you think you're getting a school fired up and you're just catching kitties. Um, you, again, like executed really good, 13 pounds. You should be feeling pretty good. I really think these decisions in between days are fascinating when you do multi-day events versus just a jackpot one day event. So compare and contrast, I mean, Jake, you, a unicorn bag, I think for Kerr, is this how you stressful is this? That. But how stressful is it? Because this is a Florida bag. You you drop a dirty 30 in Florida and you're just hoping to God to survive the rest of the week to win it. Did you kind of feel that? Well, not, not initially because like I told you, I was led astray. I thought <laughs> that I was, I thought that I was on a pattern and I told Logan, I was like, well, cause you know, you weigh in 21 pounds and everybody's thinking, oh, you know, he's on him. He's going to have another 18 or he should have another 18 or 19 but i was realistically i was like man i should be able to get you know another 13 14 maybe 15 to be a really good day well so i went out the next day and tried to replicate and i was left with one bass at 11 30 
And that's when I realized that I've been done way dirty and had to switch up what I needed to do. Why did you, I just had a curiosity, 1130 feels like I would have all, I would have been blowing a gasket by 10. <laughs> like why 11? You were like, okay, now I should panic. Um, you could say, I don't know if you could say I could, I'm stubborn or that I'm <laughs> confident because I was confident in what I was doing. I was doing what I like to do. And the last thing I wanted to do was bail on what got me there too soon and feel mm -hmm. like, you know, I fish made a scared move basically. Whereas, you know, you never know, they could turn on like a light switch. And if I come across another right stretch doing what I was doing, I could have a really good bag. So I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, too worried about it, but about 1130, I was doing, I think at a, that was a long day. So that I was, was doing it at four. Or so I, I was doing at 415. So 1130 meant that I still had, you know, I still had five, four or five hours to fish. So I knew at that point I had enough time to go make an adjustment. And so that's, that's kind of why I chose to do it then. Did you ever feel like it was a little too close for comfort? As far as... I, you had six pounds. Are you saying you felt great when you went into weigh-in with six? Or? Heck no. Okay. Hell no. <laughs> I got a, it, I got a like, text I've, from him as soon as he checked in. He was legal to text in the tournament that I can't repeat on air. So. <laughs> well, see, now I told you I made an adjustment. I didn't say I made a good one. Because... <laughs> The end of the first day, after I caught those fish, I got out of that area, and I went back in a nut bush, and I started flipping a new area I hadn't been in all week, and I got some bites. Like, I caught a couple two-and-a-halves pretty easy, but that's how it goes on days you catch them. Everything's easy, you know. And so the next day, the second day, I go in there at the end of the day thinking I'm going to fill out my limit pretty quick and end up catching three for the rest of the day. And uh, so, yeah, it didn't work. It was awful. You somehow survived, and that gets to Logan again. It looks like you just put up another well done, solid base hit, eleven pounds. Were you thinking about rotating the same water or doing something completely different? Because the spots were like, you, you did you burn spots or what? So I saw so many fish on the places I was on that you know, like I said, you throw it fifteen or twenty of them and you catch one. So it's like you know i caught one out of the 20 that were there 40 or whatever that ratio is it's like yeah they gotta eat at some point so i just i ran through i did make some other stuff in um yeah i didn't i didn't hit everything that i probably should have on day one because yeah i had that 13 i had the 13 at one o'clock and after one o'clock i went shallow but i also lost like a three and a half or so on a drop shot the only fish I even hooked on drop shot the whole tournament hmm. um, at like 1130. So, and my small one was like a 112. So I knew I was on the fish to have like 15 pounds. So if I just get, even if I go down, in my mind, it was like, if I go down at two pounds, I'm still at 13 pounds, which is what I had the first day. So I'm just going to rerun the same water with maybe a little different rotation. And, you know, like I said, with other people on the holes, yeah, you're not going to run the same rotation anyway. Um, now, I was like last boot on day one. So I was fired up to get to a schooling spot, maybe uh, catch two or three early. Okay. And then as I was running out of nut bush, I looked to my right on a clay point and saw cannonballs getting dropped in the water and decided to go over there and catch giant schoolers. And it turns out they were all stripers except for the one random giant spotted bass that would blow through them every like third time they came up. And you never caught him. It was always a striper. I caught stripers until every boat went past. And I guess once everything settled out um, and it got calm, they quit schooling. So I was last boat again. But I ran out. Yeah. So I ran out and just did the same milk run. And I was actually, yeah, I caught, I think my big one that day was a spot. And that's kind of telling because of how bad they bit. Cause I was kind of like, man, they're, you know, everyone I throw at, he's not really interested. I caught like a couple little large mouth. I had one, probably two and a half large mouth that bit right. He was set up on the stump, right? You know, I threw over there. He swam off the stump, ate the jig. It was perfect. I'm like, okay, it's about to go down. Then it didn't. Um, huh. Finally caught that like three and a quarter, three and a half spot. They got me to that 11, three. And I'm like, yeah, I come in. I ran shallow for a little while. I came in. I'm like, dang, I ain't even going to make the cut. Because we're used to these college tournaments where if you put up 13 the first day, you better put up 14 the next day or you're going to get sent home. Um, 
so I weigh in. I'm about 21. I weigh in, and I just go out in the spot lock because you know they're like, "Oh, you're gonna be fishing tomorrow," and I was like, "Yeah, sure, whatever." That's what you say at the beginning of the weigh in, and uh, yeah, I've, I've had that done to me in the opens before, all kinds of stuff. So I was like, "Yeah, I'm just gonna pull down out here, and I ain't gonna mess with it." So I just sat back and watched the weigh in for like an hour, and at like four o'clock, I'm still leading. And I was like, oh, crap, I better rig a rod or two. So I start rigging up. And uh, actually, Jake pulls up. And he's like, hey, man. He's, he's got like, a mega bag. <laughs> well, no, this is, yeah, day two. He, no, he just pulls up and he shoots me this look of like, you know, I, like he just wanted to crawl in a hole. <laughs> and he's like, dude, I blew it. I blew it. I blew it. And I was like, dude, you're still in the top 10. It's four o'clock. <laughs> like like three quarters wait. of the field's <laughs> weighed in. You're still in the top 10. You're good. Um, so he went and weighed in. I, I got done rigging up. So we, you know, at that point we were both feeling good because we knew we were going to be in the top five. We were still in all American position, and he, you know, he still had a chance to win. So and I was, you know, not chasing. just me. You were in third. <laughs> yeah, but chasing, you don't feel like that. You're just like, yep, yeah, I'm just going to go do do whatever I can. Yeah, all the so. pressures on on the person ahead. Um, exactly. The other thing is what Logan was saying about because you know he was watching him on the screen and how they'd go down and not buy like the second day was such an awful day as far as just bass fishing goes like mm-hmm. the way the fish were acting the and worst day i've ever seen see, at Kerr Lake. he was able to see their behavior and how they actually were not biting his bait they'd go down and not eat and that what he was saying about the college tournaments if you have 13 the first day you better have 14 was the other thing that kept me doing what i was doing so long because i was out there swinging all day like i was never going to let off and try to go catch, you know, eight pounds of deep fish or something like that. I was trying to catch another 15 or 16 because I thought that's what I had to have. Whereas if I'd known it was going to be that awful, I had places I could have went and caught nine, 10 pounds and been perfectly fine. So I kind of shot myself in the foot. It's the biggest superpower skill I heard on someone else's podcast where it was knowing when the lake is fishing good and when it's shit, just so that you can make those corrections. Um, I've had too many days where I'm out there thinking, man, they're not biting. And then I go to weigh in, and they were biting. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now it's like it's so hard to tell, you know. Well, and for why. and for reference on how bad it was, yeah, you know, I don't want to disparage anybody if this is wrong, but I think the biggest bag was twelve twelve by David Wright for the boater side the whole day Jeez. with a hundred and fifty guys. That's insane. That's so bad. It's <laughs> <laughs> so even, bad. Even if it, even if it was thirteen, I mean, you got a hundred and fifty dudes out there. Yeah, like, I, I wonder why, because the weights kicked back up. It was just that weird day. I mean, not by much, but curl level it did. But, but it was, again. There was no wind, bright bluebird skies. They had been okay. beat to snot, and they turned the current off. So while that water was coming in, they were they were ripping it through pretty hard, and that just makes the lake better. And they shallow, deep, doesn't matter. And they finally, the flow coming in kind of slacked off. And I guess they didn't want to keep running it through. So they shut it off and everybody felt it. Hmm. That's interesting. Going into day three, did you know if they were going to turn the current back on? Or was it just going to be shut off the rest of the rest of the tournament? I don't watch the current there much. It just, you know, after the fact, we looked it up and it's like, oh, crap. Yeah, they, they cut it off. But, uh. Day three was interesting because the weather completely changed. We had clouds most of the day, a little bit of wind, actually a lot of wind. Um, and that just, that helps Kerr a lot. They just bite a lot better, especially shallow. So looking at the way everything was about to pan out here, I, I mean, for both of you, when you went to bed that night and waked up, Jake, what did you, what was your thoughts on how you were going to go about your day? Cause, um, well, yeah, six pounds. So what was in your head going into that? Uh, honestly, I had a way better feeling going out on the last day than I did on the second day. Because <laughs> I don't know if it was just because you can, like, I mean, you fish you fish long enough, you fish enough tournaments, you, you usually have a gut feeling. If people ask you, are you going to catch them tomorrow? And whether you say yes or no, usually you have a feeling that you can tell, you know, if you're, if you're going to catch them or not. And on the second day, I was not feeling great about it. Even after catching 21, thinking I was on a pattern, I didn't feel great about it. But anyways, on going out the third day, I knew I was scrapping that completely because the first two days I didn't, I didn't have a bite till 8 30, 9 o'clock anyways. So I just scrapped that completely. I knew I was going to start in a completely different area. I hadn't been in and this area 
I'd actually found it right before the off limits. We were on Lake Gaston for Logan's bachelor trip, and I was fishing this this area of the lake, and they were schooling in it real good, and there were some big spotted bass in there. So going out the third day, I had completely different rods, and there was a nut bush was fog wall to wall. I was the first boat out. I'm going straight through the fog, can't see anything, almost hit a buoy. I was getting to where I was going. <laughs> I was, and so I get I get up to where I'm fishing. Hadn't seen it. I hadn't seen it in a week. And um, I'm out water there. Water seven foot lower. Yeah, water. Well, no, it was seven foot well, higher yeah, now. Seven foot lower time. last, last time, time you saw it, right? Yeah, last time I saw it, the water was low, and now it's flooded. But um, anyways, completely different day. The wind was blowing cloudy. So the first thing I do, there was a bunch of rock in there. I picked up a spinnerbait. It's going down the bank. Fishing rocks, fishing bushes, nothing, nothing. And I just saw a good looking willow tree, went over there and flipped in it and caught like a two and a quarter large mouth real early. It was like, I don't even think it was eight o'clock yet. Flipped a couple more pockets, didn't get any bites. So I was like, you know what, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I've, I've already fallen into this trap. So I get out, I get out off the bank, start looking on some points where they've been schooling, just little long run out points with flat spots on them or whatnot. And I dropped the trolling motor and They've got the bait all the way out on the end of it, right where it drops, and I see the spots cutting through the bait. And on one point, I had the first point, I had 11, about what I weighed. I had like 10, 10, 11 pounds of spotted bass in bait on a Demiki rig. It was a queen tackle rolling head. That and one other rock pile that I had in there, which was in 20 foot, and now it was in 30, but they were still on it, luckily. Hmm. So wow. between between a couple schooling points and some deep rock, I was able to put together eleven, and knew at that point that I had had a pretty good shot. Logan, yeah. So I, so you know, Jake just ran through the fog because he was fishing for sixty five grand, and uh, <laughs> I drove a mile, hit the fog. So so to be fair, in the morning, the we're in Nutbush, and it's got that turn as you go out. And the tournament director sees the fog like settling like very quickly. And he's just like, when y'all make that turn, it's going to get foggy. Y'all be careful. All right, let's go. And you came around that corner and it was like, I could see Jake's boat and then the guy but in between me and him. And then Jake's boat disappears. It's like, okay, well, I can still see the guy in front of me and he can see Jake's boat. So we're good. And then that guy disappeared. I'm like, all right, screw it. I ain't freaking doing this. So I whipped around, counted everybody going by to make sure I wasn't going to run somebody going back. And then I ran back and fished for a lease fish for an hour and a half. I actually missed two that were really? looked, yeah, they looked pretty good. One blew my top water out of the water twice, didn't eat it. And then I flipped one up that when I hit him, I just saw a flash and it looked big, but you know how that is. They flash four foot down. They look big. They usually aren't. So <laughs> after that, though, it kind of fog kind of lifted. So we ran out and I think I had a limit at like, I think we ran out at 830 and I had a limit at maybe 10, maybe earlier. Like it was quick. That's not bad. No, no. And, and, and for reference, the day before, I think it was like 1230 till I had a limit. So, yeah. you know, it was it was a great day. <laughs> and uh, I, and at that point, the, the great part about that was. I could run stuff that you couldn't run before. So like the wind was blowing um, north to south and I was running just rock points facing into the wind, places that you know at night they're they're pulling up to feed on crawfish and everything else. And you pull up, there'd be five of them sitting there. You throw the jig out there, one of them would eat is two pounder. You do this, you go to the next one, pull up, catch him, two pounder. And it's community holes. And all week you couldn't get on them. So I was running my sneaky stuff before, but now 12 boats out there, everybody's doing their own thing. I just ran the community holes, got 10, 11 pounds. And, uh, you know, so I'm feeling good. Yeah. You know, I know I'm in the all American unless we have just the craziest day ever. So I'm just running around now. It's like, I can do whatever. And I knew that deep bout wasn't great the day before, but I still felt like it was my best chance to get a big one. Um, so I ran that for two, maybe two or three more hours, and it was just not happening. I don't know if the wind pushed them up or the clouds messed them up, but or maybe I just didn't commit to it long enough. But with everything going on, and I saw a little bit of schooling, I decided to change it up since I knew I was in the All-American and just go shallow and go for broke. And uh, right before I ran shallow, I ran to Jake. I saw him over there. I thought it was him. 
he was fishing down a willow stretch. And I saw him sit down. I wasn't going to pull in on him, but I saw him sit down to leave. So I cranked up, ran over there, said, what you got? He said, I got like 11 pounds. I said, okay, he's good. You know, he's got three pounds on me already. So we both got like 11 pounds. We can go do whatever we want now. We're both in the All-American. We're good. So mm-hmm. we turn around and, and we start running shallow. Um, I caught like a two and a half on a spinner bait. And my coat loses like a three on a chatter bait. So it's like, okay, moving bait bite. Well, I'm throwing spinner bait over these bushes and my coat flips in there and catches uh, almost four pounder behind me, which in a pocket that has given up big ones in the past. And it's like, man, I need, yeah, I needed that one. But, uh, yeah, that, that was good for him though. And, uh, he ended up catching one more little one. They ended up winning the tournament on the co-angler oh, wow. side. So, and he, I had him on day two as well. So he, he kind of knew what was up. Uh, and I think I made one more call at the end of the day flipping. And then, yeah, that was my 13 pounds. But well, I called a pile of fish. Either. <laughs> yeah. So well, how, and, how and I had called, <laughs> yeah, well, I called a, a pile of fish. And it was weird because I was thinking, you know, wind going the whole nine yards. I came in, I'm like, all right, I probably freaking dropped a spot or two because these boys had free ran of the lake just like I did. They probably cracked them. Cause I probably had the bots based on what I missed and lost for 15 or 16 pounds. I'm like these boys probably cracked them. And we get in there and they're all like, dude, this is the worst day yet. It was terrible. I hated it. I, yeah, I didn't catch nothing. It's like, oh crap, I might win this thing, you know, but not It's so. interesting. Cause you guys seem like you had two, this has always been fascinating when you have guys at fish alike and you can have two just randomly different things. Like it seems like Jake, you were like, yes, yeah, screw shallow. I'm going to go deep. And you were like, screw deep. I'm going to go shallow, but yeah. both were effective in generically the same area of the lake and if it was let's say generically the same area of the lake is it just mindset at that point of what you're more comfortable with yeah mm-hmm. yeah no doubt the uh <laughs> that's part of the reason i stuck with what i was doing for so long is because that's just what i'm more comfortable with if i can if i can find a shallow bite i'm usually going to lean that way i can do both but i'd rather catch them shallow whereas logan over the past couple of years has been getting more comfortable deep so that's kind of what he was looking for well, and, and I used to be more like Jake in that sense because – so I did learn when I was in Raleigh, like those lakes you have to learn to fish deep, Jordan and Falls and all that. So I learned how to do it there, and then me and him have, have scoped a lot at Norman, which is a fool's errand. Don't do it. But <laughs> if you want to win, do not scope at Norman. But it's a good learning ground. Um, but really what it was, and you can look at Lewis Minetti's uh, Instagram, he has a quote from me at Toledo Bend – when there's bass on the beds, there's 171,000 acres of fishable shallow water and everybody was out there scoping and beating our brains in. And I had a quote from him as we were losing in the open that said, be a man, lose on the bank. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they lived I, by it. They lived by oh, it for yeah. six months. <laughs> I lived by it through all six of the opens I fished and then I bailed on the last three and I decided I was tired of that. So I learned how to scope. And ever since I've been, you know, it's the same thing. It's like now that I'm decent with it, I I know if I don't go do it, I'm giving them boys back their advantage, right? So you got to take it while you got it. What's the biggest thing you learned from it about scoping? You just don't stop. <laughs> you just keep freaking doing it. There's you feel gross. That sit in a lot of stupid areas. That's a yes. Fact. And how many fish look at your bait that don't commit and makes you feel like a jackass before you had it about, oh, I have a good hunch about this place. It's like, you know, you dumbass. It's like you've had about 38 fish look at your jerk bait and not want to eat it, actually. <laughs> Dude, we thought when at Norman, we thought back in 360 days, we pull up to a brush pile and we catch two and it's like, oh, that's the only two in there. No, that was 30. <laughs> there was 36 spotted bass in that brush pile. You pulled all of them. Two swam back. You caught the other one. <laughs> like the rest of them are under your boat staring up yeah. at you. Fifteen followed him in. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, though. It just it really opened my eyes to like I felt like how terrible I was as an angler. But Jesus, we just stick with baits too damn long. Like I'm in boats with guys up here that literally just I feel like they created scope. They're so good with it, and they're like, "Yep, that right there is a four pounder. That's a four to F one fifty. That's a quarter on heads." They don't like this bait within one cast, and they flip it. It's like Jesus Christ. How do you from that blob tell that he's not interested in it that quick? But it's your ability to change baits so freaking quick. That's the that's the secret sauce. And so, for example, on that, you know. 
I think a year ago, I don't weigh in what I weighed in this tournament. And if I did, it wouldn't have been doing what I was doing. But I figured out that, like, if you threw, you know, everybody just throws their drop shot or whatever at these fish, and they want to, like, hit them. And I figured out if you throw that thing and you, you know, you got it like 10 foot from them or like five foot from them and you kind of brought it where it was, this is going to sound crazy, but like coming away from them where they almost just catch a glimpse of it and they got to swim off their stump that they've been sitting on for the last six months to come mm-hmm. look at that bait. That's when you catch them. If you knocked them on the head and they did a circle on it, like, and looked really aggressive, they would not touch it. They had to like be inquisitive, like, oh, what the heck was that? They go over there and they'd eat it. It was it was really weird, but but I've seen that at Norman, I've seen that other places where if you hit them on the head, they better be aggressive because usually it spooks them. It's kind of weird. It is weird because like that's I had preconceived notions before scope. That's the same. I also had preconceived notions of how deep you can call them on top water. I know Lake Anna's got a, that when <laughs> Lake Anna gets gin clear and you're in thirty feet of water, there's no fish there. You hit a splash and they come up. It's like son of a bitch. How the hell can you see that? Like it makes no sense how you can see that bait. The sure, the craziest the one day. me yeah. yeah the craziest one me and Jake have ever seen um it was it was on a spot we called the moon because it's so deep at Norman it's rocks in like fifty foot of water and I was throwing a kite take on this is when we first got scoped so we didn't really know that much about it and we're watching my swim bait come up and it's at ten feet from the top of the water it had just come out of twenty but it was coming up and we see something shoot off the bottom in fifty and we're like he's not coming to eat my bait is he and i just stopped it and just held it and it just sat there 10 foot under the boat and he swam from 50 foot down to come eat my bait 10 foot under the boat and we walked like we were joking about it while he's coming up it's like there's no way that is not gonna happen and then he come up bonk. Beneath. <laughs> that's freaking insane they can see it though i don't know like it just really changes the way i think about them um and how they act at Kerr and in places like that, Murray. I saw them at Murray. But do you think it's actually helped the weights at Kerr, honestly, the scope deal? I think it's probably made it more yeah. consistent. Uh, yeah. The top end weights, well, we know about one this spring, but mostly the top end weights hadn't changed probably much. But there's a lot of 13, 13, 14, 15 pound bags, it seems like. That come off scope. Yeah, they come off yeah. scope. Well, I mean, heck, even, you know, Jonathan Carlson, I think you interviewed him. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of tangentially know him. But he won in, what, April, scoping mm-hmm. brush piles and stumps. Like, you couldn't have made that happen five years ago. Like, nobody would even think about going offshore that time of year ten years ago. No, but – it, you got like you just said earlier like those Hartwell guys there's some people that will just now be deep 24 7 like they mm-hmm. won't go shallow um <laughs> what did what did tyler campbell say day three um <laughs> uh, i don't know about day three i know on the first day though he was said something about or it might have been the last day he said even when they're on the bank i won't fish the bank anymore <laughs> <laughs> And that joker is good. He called good. like I think he said he was catching sixty to seventy a day out there. He finished fourth. Jesus. So, what are those Ohio guys like? Dude, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> they're all funny as hell. <laughs> they're yeah, they're they've hilarious. Got, they've got they're a lot of sticks. Oh, they're morbidly they're, depressed. I mean, look where they have to fish all the time. I mean, <laughs> that is the one good thing is they're all in such good spirits being at Crystal Lake just because they're not on the Ohio River. <laughs> Dude, my co from day two and three, he, you know, he was from the Ohio River, and he's like, yeah, "Yeah, man." He grabbed his rod. He's like, "I'm going to get a beer out of the truck." I was like, "Cool." Well, he calls me and he's like, "Hey, I'm gonna. We're both gonna be in the top ten. I'm gonna meet you down there." So I bring you a beer, and then the next day he didn't even like say anything. He just brought it to me. <laughs> it's like, heck yeah, dude. It's like, <laughs> I'm good guys. It's just a weird like if you pick where to fish. Would it be better to grow up in a tough fishery like that or a great fishery? Like, what would make you better? And I, I don't like does does that Ohio mindset play anymore with live scope about having to hit a tree thirty eight times now that you have scope and you can just hunt down the only five fish that live in the lake? Maybe not the Ohio, but the Illinois does because apparently Illinois just pumps out like the best bass fisherman that's ever lived between Trey McKinney and Jacob Wheeler and all these boys. 
It's insane. Me, per- me personally, if I grew up in Ohio and had to fish those places, I'd probably not be a bass fisherman. I'd probably find, <laughs> I'd probably find something else to catch. They have the biggest deer in the freaking country. Yeah, Why are they, they bass do. fishing? <laughs> they do. But Jersey pumps out some great anglers, and they got four ponds and dead bodies, and then in the Ohio River has got three fish in it. And it's just insane how many people come out of that versus – people i've met from texas and stuff that i just think that warps your mind about what you're fishing and everything it does and i don't know if that's a a, if if you really wanted to train yourself to get better like if that just it spoils you too much being able to fish really high quality fisheries like that 24 7. yeah i mean if that's your main goal in life is to be the best bass fisherman you can be then growing up on one of those places definitely would help you because that's what people used to say about norman when half the pros in the field are from north carolina is because, you know, this place at one point was really tough and you had to catch them so many different ways in mm. a day just to put together a bag where it was it was brutal on your, you know, on your mind, but it made you better. So, I mean, it definitely, definitely helped coming from a place like that. Well, and what you're, and what you're talking about too, we, me and Jake talk about it. You don't really see any pros from like the Raleigh area or even Kerr for that matter, even though they have really, you know, a lot of fishermen. And I think that's because, and there are some exceptions. You know, Cody Pike, he's from the Raleigh area. He's done well. I think he won a FLW, um, a couple other guys. But for the most part, like Norman pumps out a whole lot more, right? And I think huh. it's because when you're in Raleigh, it's like, you know, me and Jake pull up to Jordan tournaments, like we got four rods. And that's all you have to have. Whereas if you're at Norman, you'll have 10 on the deck and you're huh. going to pull six more out by the end yeah. of the day. Five so, and four in your spot to the left. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. That makes sense, though. You have to have that that you know two minute drill scrambling mentality, like quarterback. And you don't get that if you get to be the quarterback for Alabama, sort of speak. Mm. Uh, you don't get to develop that fear, I guess, of, of coming in with no fish. What's the uh, worst place you guys have ever fished that kicked your ass tournament wise? Hair change sucks. Hair I, <laughs> I was really? just about I was just about God. to say that's why that's why we're talking about North Carolina and tough lakes up here being versatile. That's why we suck in Florida. Because you get down there and you've got your spot dragging your mm-hmm. Carolina rig and I'm over here I hit thirty seven set shell bars and you should have been sitting on one for nine hours and they're gonna swim up there to you. What do you guys think of the Potomac River then? I've never been. Me either. Really? I, I was I'd, leading I'd like day two of the James River of a regional two years ago, so it was, felt pretty good to make the All-American this time. But Yeah, the, J- the James River, what's nice is that does suit more milk runny stuff versus mm. the Potomac with its grass beds where, yeah, you got to camp. Like all the Carolina guys I talk to, they say they get the shakes when they have to fish up there and like, oh, you want me to power pole down in Belmont Bay for eight hours? F that. I'm not doing that. Yeah, which, is, which is funny because one of our you know, semi-buddies – won the regional up there jason barnes what two years ago really? i guess 22 and he did exactly that he found one grass patch and like won it out like what 60 yards or something that's yeah i think so according to what he said i think that's what he told me so or what he told you it's possible it's just it's a different mindset man i really do think those are the two the two extremes is the milk running carolina guy and the florida just power pull down like i don't I think that, I mean, you could say the TVA is its own little cat there. I don't, I don't See, know. I, grew, I guess I grew, it is. The ten, I grew up the Tennessee River in kind of with Florida and yeah. that, uh, as far camping. as people, yeah, camping, you know, I just don't, I just can't do that. Well, they also make you guys go there at a shitty time of year too. Like if you're going to force a ledge bite, that's always going to play into that, which is, yeah. which is the thing about live scope in tournaments. It's like, well, don't go to Toledo Bend in February, you dumbass. Like, of course it's going to be a live scope deal. Like go there at a different time of year. Like yeah, it's so, not. what you were talking about there though is interesting because you know so in that James River be, uh, regional, I had like four bites in practice. It was just terrible, and I called one of my Potomac River buddies, um, and he's like, "Yeah, man." He's like, "Where'd you catch your biggest one?" And I told him, "He's like, okay, go there and don't leave." And I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "No, like don't crank your motor, don't just." <laughs> Two circles. And I was like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I need to do it because I don't have a choice. And I almost won. <laughs> it's like, holy crap, that was really stupid. At least, at least on a tidal river, you've got changing variables mm-hmm. the whole day. You mm-hmm. know, water. That now that's one of the few places that you can you can fit right through an area, come right back through on a different tide and catch them all day doing that. I, 
I've talked to like stretch. Chaz and um, Alex who just won a BFL up on the Potomac. He's from Jersey and he fishes the Delaware. I still think those are the hardest places to practice for because it's, oh, yeah. I think a lake in general is easier because you can at least graph and see shit. Hopefully like maybe we'll catch it, but uh, like a river, it's like, well, that tree at half past noon on a high moon will have a bass on it. Well, like, unless you fish the damn place, how the hell would you know that? Yeah. Dude, you the know? interview with Chris Baldwin, who's made like 800 All-Americans at this point after that tournament, just got me. Because he's like, man, I've qualified for like three or four All-Americans down here, and it's always off the same stretch. And yeah, I went down it four times and didn't get a bite, but I knew they were going to be on it. And he's like, I went down the fifth time at 13 pounds. It's like, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? That's a lie. But it's not. <laughs> it's, like, not. it's not. I've seen it. It's <laughs> not a lie. <laughs> Ah, uh, dude, no, it, but there's also a mental thing there too. that because I've I've known a ton of river rats here where they will they will power pull down in Belmont and not move and they will throw a Cinco and I shit you not. They will still catch 22 pounds and you would it's like punching your forehead into a brick wall, but it works. <laughs> and is it insanity or is it intelligence to know to do that? Like, I don't I don't know. I, I at least got trolling motor around the damn place a little bit, but I cannot just lock in like that. Uh, I think a lot of that too goes with grass fisheries because, you know, TVA has a lot of grass in it. And then, yep. you know, Potomac has grass. James doesn't have as much. And it doesn't seem to place mm -hmm. quite that same way. Mm -hmm. uh, but like Florida's grass, of course, it seems like, and you see it through guys like Brian Schmidt. I think he had, you know, he's got multiple tour level wins. And I think that he had never made a top 10 on a lake without grass or something. It was yeah. some insane stat. It was like, yeah, that just shows you that the mentality is completely different when you get on a place that has that stuff. Yeah, it just because it holds grass will hold so many freaking fish in an, in an acre. It doesn't. Yeah, it's acre. asinine. Ten um, feet. Yeah, yeah, ten feet. I mean, that's why I think Gunnersville until they start killing the grass this year, like that's why that place was able to pump out so many mega bags when it's basically beaten like a twenty dollar hooker with how much fishing pressure it gets. It's because of that grass. Because if you go to like Smith, like Martin stuff. They're shit compared to Gunnersville and what they can produce. Mm -hmm. But guys, I mean, I really appreciate you guys coming on tonight. Um, I heard one of you guys has a merch company that they're starting. So, I, Logan, why are you going to talk about that? Yeah, so maybe maybe not merch company, but uh, I do custom fishing jerseys, the sublimated jerseys, and uh, and hoodies like everybody has. Um, just started the company up. It's called D to D um, Custom Sports Apparel. And that stands for daylight to dark. Um, I don't have you know the website up. We're working on that. But you know if anybody wants something, just reach out to me on Facebook or anything. I'd be happy to help you out. Hats incoming too. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> you I need to put that, that slogan though across the chest, like lose shallow. That would uh, yeah. <laughs> be a man there's, lose on the bank. Be a man there's a lot of bank. people that would like that. Oh, that, Jake, uh, I think that might have been his most popular post for a while. Like when he posted that, it got, it went around. So. <laughs> oh my gosh, Jake! Uh, anything we can promote for you here? Uh, yes, sir. Queen Tackle. They uh, he's a local guy over here, and he helps me and Logan both out. I know the past past couple of weeks that his new rolling head. I've been utilizing that a bunch, as well as a half ounce flipping jig. It's always tied on. Guys, as always, link in the episode description everything we talked about. If Jonathan gets a website up in the next seven days, I'll link that too. Otherwise, I'll put his Facebook and his email address there so you can get in contact with him with that. Uh, if you want to go check us out on our website or check us out on Patreon, that's the reason this show is able to do. As you guys know, in 2025, I'm starting Casting for Conservation, our nonprofit, to do supplemental fish stocking of the Potomac River and fixing up some boat docks. Like, subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.